Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to discuss traumatic brain injury, the most common cause of mortality in all traumatic deaths. Traumatic brain injury accounts for about one and a half million ER visits and uh, 750,000 hospitalizations every year, and more than 53,000 will die annually. Uh, the number one cause, of course, is motor vehicle collisions. No big surprise there. Uh, right behind that, though, are falls, typically in the elderly. That's about 35% of traumatic brain injuries, uh, compared to 50% of, uh, of the traumatic brain injuries being due to motor vehicle collisions. Um, men are about three times more likely to end up with a brain injury and uh, not surprising that's because us guys we do some pretty stupid stuff it's kind of the hold my beer and watch this kind of thing probably um, regardless the uh, the falls um, if you think about it that is a common cause of head trauma in the elderly uh, as well as anyone who has any kind of clotting deficiency such as an alcoholic uh, or someone with uh, some sort of hemophilia or uh, missing some sort of clotting factors. Um, we'll touch on some of that here today. Before we do that, though, I want to touch briefly on some of the um, anatomy of the brain and uh, as it relates to uh, traumatic brain injury, specifically bleeding inside the cranial vault. As you see there on your screen, we're talking about the meninges and intracranial hemorrhage. The meningeal layers uh, consist of three primary layers which include the dura mater, the arachnoid layer, and the pia mater. Dura mater is that outermost. It, clear, it adheres right to the inside surface of the cranial vault. And then just below that you have the arachnoid layer and right beneath that, as the name implies, subarachnoid, below the arachnoid space. And right inside this space here is uh, primarily filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which is there to cushion, bathe, and, uh, and nourish the brain tissue. And right against the cortex of the brain itself, it hears the pia mater, and that's our other meningeal layer. When you hear someone talk about meningitis, you're talking about an inflammation and infection of those meningeal layers, just for uh, reference sake. Now, with those layers and locations in mind, let's talk about these different locations of intracranial hemorrhage. We'll start with epidural hematoma. This involves bleeding, which as the name implies, epa, meaning above, the dural layer. So this is bleeding that's occurring above the dura mater, between that layer and the inside of the cranial vault. This bleed, usually about 90% of them occur due to a rupture of an artery, usually what we refer to as the middle meningeal artery. Now, not surprisingly, because just like any external bleed where you have uh, uh, rapid bleeding, blood spurting, and so forth associated with an artery that's been damaged. Uh, the same thing is true inside the brain where you have this middle meningeal artery uh, that has been damaged. That bleeding is going to occur fairly rapidly because the blood, just like in any other artery in your body, the blood inside there is under uh, relatively high pressure compared to, say, your veins, which are under low pressure, and that type of bleed tends to be kind of slow by comparison. Um, with an epidural hematoma, we have a textbook pattern that, uh, and I mean literally textbook because virtually every uh, textbook that discusses this uses this pattern to describe the course of an epidural hematoma patient they will mention that there is an immediate loss of consciousness at the time of the insult, the time of impact in a motor vehicle collision, for example. And that loss of consciousness is followed by a lucid interval. That's how they usually phrase it, meaning that the patient regains consciousness, is talking uh, of sound mind, they're, they know who they are, where they are, and uh, what 
year it is and so forth. Um, and then after that, they experience a rapid decline, uh, deterioration in their mental status, their level of consciousness. Now, I say that's the textbook pattern. I emphasize that for one very specific reason, and that is, well, only about 30 to 50% of these patients will have that lucid interval. So that's half or more who won't have that lucid interval, so they don't fit the textbook pattern. Um, it's kind of unfortunate that we've been taught that way when really that's uh, kind of the exception rather than the rule, but such is the, uh, the nature of, uh, of textbooks. In any case, uh, if you do have that uh, lucid interval with an epidural hematoma because this bleeding is arterial usually and is occurring rapidly, you will, by extension, have a rapid deterioration of their level of consciousness. These patients, the mortality rate's about 20%, but with immediate intervention, the prognosis is actually pretty good. And usually what they will do to intervene here is uh, drill holes, essentially. They call them burr holes in the skull, maybe remove a, a section of the skull itself to open it up and allow that bleeding to be able to have a route of escape. The, the idea here is to uh, limit or decrease the pressure that is building up inside the cranial vault because your brain tissue does not respond well to pressure, uh, not to mention the fact that that pressure uh, begins to impede blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. So compare that with what we refer to as a subdural hematoma. These account for about 30% of uh, severe traumatic brain injuries. Uh, now, uh, in contrast to an epidural hematoma, which is arterial in source, a subdural bleed is typically the result of a venous bleed. As you see here on your screen, where you have this bridging vein that is going from the meningeal layers and down into the brain tissue, adhering there because of motion of the, the uh, brain with inside the cranial vault, because there is a little bit of movement there, especially the, the older a person is. Uh, the brain begins to atrophy, gets smaller inside the cranium, and then it's able to move more freely inside the cranial vault. And when that occurs, these bridging veins might get pulled, tugged on, torn, and venous bleeding occurs. Now, this bleeding, it, like I said, it's venous typically and is relatively slow. Uh, so the textbook pattern, again, I emphasize textbook because it's not uh, as common as what the textbook might lead you to believe, but we say that the, progr the progression is relatively slow. So they start with that immediate loss of consciousness at uh, the time of impact, then they regain consciousness, maybe they get to a period where they are lucid again, and then after that there is a slow deterioration and loss of consciousness. And by slow, it can be very slow. It could be hours, it could be days, weeks. In some cases, it can even be months if we have a chronic bleed. Um, that's not uncommon in an elderly patient who perhaps has fallen. They uh, have this injury and they get up, they go on about their business, they uh, go on about their lives, and maybe this injury was trivial Often, they don't even remember anything happened. Maybe they slipped in the shower, didn't think much of it, but there nevertheless was this uh, tearing of a vein inside their skull, and the bleeding occurs so slowly that um, it begins to manifest symptoms and signs over a long period of time, sometimes even months. And those symptoms can be very nonspecific, possibly a chronic headache, up to and including an unexplained coma. So this patient may not be found at the scene of a motor vehicle collision uh, when they are having symptoms. They may be at home sitting in their recliner or lying in bed and family members just aren't able to get them to wake up and they don't know why. Um, <clears throat> you could have this patient could very well have been seen in the hospital after whatever caused the initial injury. Maybe they were there, they got a CAT scan, 
and because the bleeding is so slow, maybe it didn't even show up on the CAT scan to where a physician could see it, um, so they were sent home. So these are something to watch for because you might not see them in the setting of trauma, but rather in a, in a setting where there's an unexplained uh, diminishing of their mental capacity. And once again, if these are treated, it's often uh, through the use of burr holes where the blood is evacuated and that space gets irrigated with some warm saline and usually the bleeding is controlled. Now, one thing you might be wondering is why is it that a patient who has a slow venous bleed, why does it progress? Why doesn't it just clot like any other bleed uh, in or out of your body? You would think that eventually that blood's going to clot, the bleeding's going to stop, and the body's going to, you know, reabsorb that uh, that that uh, that clot later on. However, elderly patients in particular are at greater risk because they are more often on anticoagulant medications, blood thinners, things that prevent the clotting, and that makes them at much higher risk. In fact, about um, <clears throat> uh, 25% of patients who are older than 65 who take anticoagulants, believe it or not, they can end up having a negative or mild um, CT scan uh, diagnosis after any of these sorts of things. So uh, anticoagulated patients, they themselves can be missed uh, in their initial evaluation. Those patients are rarely considered to have any serious or life-threatening injuries, but uh, they could have hemorrhages almost uh, immediately after the impact, and somewhere around 6% can have hemorrhages that show up within 24 hours, so it's kind of delayed, which explains why a number of them get missed. And there, once again, is a, another image of the subdural hematoma, just emphasizing with the color blue there that that bleeding is typically venous. Some other patients that are at greater risk here are uh, people with clotting deficiencies, such as alcohol abuse, hemophilia, I kind of touched on that earlier, um, but because their blood clotting is impaired, uh, these slow bleeds don't get controlled quite the way that they would normally if, uh, if their body was, was acting as it would in any other person. And then lastly, our other type of hematoma we're going to discuss briefly is the intracerebral hematoma. These are actually really rare. Um, however, when they do occur, the mortality rate is really high. Even if they get surgery to correct it, uh, the mortality is still about 45%. Um, these are rare, often involving some sort of penetrating trauma to the head, whether it be a gunshot wound, uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, sharp objects, uh, an impaled object, something of that nature, that pierces the, the skull and into the brain tissue itself. This type of hematoma can be problematic with as little as five milliliters of blood in the tissue. So it doesn't take a lot for the pressure to be severe enough to cause uh, damage inside the brain. And so we're talking like a teaspoon of blood is enough to cause problems. Unfortunately, uh, because this bleeding is inside the brain tissue, the location of the bleed frequently precludes any opportunity to have surgery to fix the problem. Uh, the patient may develop a clot deep inside the brain tissue that doesn't uh, get reabsorbed properly, as you might expect, and because you'd have to destroy brain tissue in order to get to the source of the bleed, that often is enough to make uh, them no longer a candidate for surgery. So that's why the prognosis is so bad. All tissues respond to injury with swelling and bleeding. Much of the bleeding could be microscopic, occur relatively slowly, and the brain tissue is no different. Uh, when an injury occurs, there's swelling. And unfortunately, unlike other body tissues, the brain is limited in the amount of swelling that's possible because there are limitations, there are restrictions of this skull or rigid box, as the Monroe Kelly Doctrine refers to it. The brain begins to swell, the bleeding increases, the pressure builds in this localized space until it fills all the available space inside the cranial vault. And when that occurs, uh, 
uh, and that pressure increases, we refer to it as intracranial pressure. The Monroe Kelly Doctrine recognizes that the skull is a rigid box, meaning it doesn't stretch, it doesn't expand. There's no room for things to uh, push outward if uh, you have an increase in, say, blood volume because of a ruptured vessel inside the cranium. So you have those three things essentially inside the skull, the brain, the blood, and the cerebrospinal fluid. And Monroe Kelly Doctrine, talking about intracranial pressure increases, say you've got a bleed, that blood volume inside the cranium begins to increase, and by necessity, in order for the pressure to come back down, something else has to decrease whether that is through the body reabsorbing cerebrospinal fluid to take some of it out of the equation, or in cases where the, the uh, pressure gets big enough, it can actually start to push brain tissue out of the way. Uh, and we refer to that as herniation. We'll discuss that in more detail here in a moment. But <clears throat> as this bleeding occurs and the pressure builds, if it's slow enough, the bleeding is slow enough, the body does have some uh, uh, mechanisms for auto-regulating and compensating by reabsorbing the cerebrospinal fluid. However, if the bleeding is occurring too rapidly, that mechanism of reabsorbing of uh, cerebrospinal fluid just can't keep up, and the pressure will build to dangerous levels. Compression of the blood vessels due to that building pressure inside the cranium causes blood flow through the blood vessels inside the cranium to be restricted. They're put under pressure so less blood is able to reach the brain and that means less oxygen being provided to the brain. So the brain is under pressure and in response to this the brain sends signals that say I'm being deprived of oxygen, I need more blood, get me more blood. So the blood vessels respond by sending more blood up into the cranium and the way they do this is by dilating or opening up the blood vessels inside the skull. Unfortunately, that increase in blood volume causes the intracranial pressure to get even higher. And at some point, the intracranial pressure gets uh, higher than your body's systemic blood pressure. And at the point where intracranial pressure is higher than your arterial blood pressure, there's another reflex that kicks in called the uh, central nervous system ischemic response initiated by the hypothalamus. Uh, it activates your sympathetic nervous system or what you might have heard referred to as the fight or flight system. And that causes the vasculature, the blood vessels out in the rest of your body, the peripheral uh, vessels, to constrict, to get smaller. And what that does is that shunts more blood up toward your head where the vessels are wide open. So once again, trying to get more blood and oxygen to the brain tissue that's being starved, but all the while inadvertently making it worse because the intracranial pressure is increased by that increase in blood flow. So it becomes this, uh, this vicious cycle and the result of that constriction of the vessels throughout your body means that blood pressure is going to be higher. And that is because your body is trying to get your blood pressure to, um, to exceed the pressure inside your skull in order to push blood in. It has to be higher than the intracranial pressure. And at some point, these baroreceptors or stretch receptors that are contained within the heart and the great vessels, they detect this increase in blood pressure. And the heart gets these signals and says, okay, this, is, this pressure is too high, I've got to do something to bring it down. So it begins to slow your heart rate, sometimes to the point where it's drastically slowed to the point of bradycardia. And then one other thing that happens because of that increase in pressure, uh, the perfusion of the brain stem suffers as well. So the brain stem, which controls involuntary functions such as breathing, uh, is being 
starved of blood and being put under pressure. And that causes your respirations to become disorganized, abnormal, irregular in pattern. Taken together, you have a slowing pulse rate, blood pressure increases, and respirations become irregular, disorganized. Taken together, those findings are referred to as Cushing's triad. The Cushing's reflex is essentially the body's last ditch effort to save brain tissue during periods of poor perfusion. Unfortunately, when you see this triad of signs in a patient with head trauma, brainstem herniation is almost imminent, uh, if not already occurring. And the patient's prognosis at this stage is really grim because these are late signs of increased intracranial pressure. And that brings us to the topic of herniation. When you see Cushing's reflex in these signs and symptoms, you're probably looking at someone whose brain is herniating, meaning the tissue is being pushed into an area where it does not belong. Uh, maybe it's being shifted over to another side, maybe in one of the ventricle surfaces, uh, ventricle areas inside the brain, the small cavities, brain tissues being forced into those cavities, filling them up, or the brain tissue is being pushed downward into this opening at the base of the skull and into the, the spinal column, an opening that we refer to as the foramen magnum. When that type of herniation occurs, you could have pressure put on what you see here in yellow, the oculomotor nerves. These cranial nerves are going to your eyes and they control the diameter of your pupils, whether they are constricted or dilated. And when pressure is put on them in a sufficient amount, it's gonna cut off the brain signals to your eye. And when that happens, the pupil that's being affected will dilate and no longer be reactive to light. And if both uh, oculomotor nerves are under pressure, you might have bilaterally blown fully dilated pupils that do not react to light. In any case, when you see these kind of uh, pupillary changes, that's a pretty good indication that your patient's brain is herniating. Um, a patient that just has one non-reactive dilated pupil has a mortality of about 67%. You might uh, also see things like abnormal posturing, decorticate, or decerebrate posturing. You might have things like uh, Babinski reflex, and then you might even see these um, reactions that are sometimes referred to as doll's eyes, uh, where just like a, one of those old time dolls that you move its head and its eyes seem to follow you regardless of where you position the head, uh, that could occur with a patient whose brain has herniated. However, I don't recommend doing this on a patient to check for it because sometimes brain trauma is accompanied by spinal trauma and you don't want to be twisting their head and their neck back and forth. So <clears throat> what do we do for patients that we suspect have a herniation? Well, one thing you don't want to do is routinely hyperventilate patients with evidence of head injury. Hyperventilating, let's, let's talk about this because it's a controversial subject. There are times when hyperventilating to a degree is appropriate, but there are more times when it is not. Um, think about what a person having an anxiety attack might experience. Sometimes patients having an anxiety attack begin to hyperventilate and uh, sometimes they get lightheaded, sometimes they even faint. So when that happens, the reason why they pass out is because hyperventilating causes the body to blow off too much carbon dioxide. Believe it or not, your body does need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. However, you blow too much of it off, the body's response is to constrict blood vessels uh, supplying the brain, reducing blood flow and therefore oxygen to the brain cells. 
when that reaches uh, a certain point, you lose consciousness. That's the reason why someone who's hyperventilating and an anxiety attack might pass out. With a patient that we are using uh, a bag valve mask to breathe for them, we're using this positive pressure if we're bagging them too quickly, too aggressively. We, in the same way, are blowing off too much of the patient's carbon dioxide. And in response, we are uh, causing those vessels inside the skull to constrict and reduce blood flow to the brain. Now, with someone who has uh, increased intracranial pressure and a, a bleed inside the skull, you might think, hey, cutting off that blood flow to the brain might help relieve that pressure, right? Well, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword. There's a catch-22 here where you're reducing that blood flow, perhaps reducing the pressure, but at the same time, you are limiting the amount of blood and oxygen that is reaching the cells. So you're actually not doing them any service because the pressure inside the skull is also limiting blood supply and oxygen delivery to those cells. So you're just doing the same thing by a different mechanism. So you have to be very careful here. So it's a balancing act. If you have a patient whose uh, traumatic brain injury is severe enough that you have evidence of brain herniation, meaning you've got Cushing's reflex present, you've got uh, one or both pupils that are fully dilated and not reactive to light, uh, you've got the abnormal posturing of the body. If you see any of those there, you can pretty well say there's a good chance they've got uh, a herniation of the brain. In those cases, you can do a mild form of hyperventilation. I'm not so concerned about the rate that you use to bag this patient as I am the entitled CO2 value that you have on your monitor. You need to maintain their entitled somewhere between 30 and 35. If you bag them any more aggressively, that number is going to go below 30 and you're actually doing them perhaps more harm than good. Uh, Normally, we want a patient's entitled to be between 35 and 45. With a, uh, a brain that's herniating, we can do it a little bit more uh, aggressive with the bagging to bring that number down to between 30 and 35. So that's all you want to do with hyperventilation. The other number to watch is your, um, your pulse oximetry. We're looking to maintain 94% or a little above. What I tell people is 94 to 99. Do not get a patient so oxygenated that their uh, SpO2 reads 100%. Why is that? Well, frankly, whether you're giving them 15 liters per minute or 50 liters per minute, if such a thing is possible, if it reads 100% at 15 liters per minute, and it still reads 100% at 50 liters per minute, you have no idea, based on that value, you have no idea how much oxygen you are giving that patient. So at least if you're at 99, you know where you are. You know that you're not exceeding the patient's need for oxygen uh, because giving a patient too much oxygen Remember, the body uses that oxygen, and as a result of burning the fuel, there are byproducts. There are uh, toxic wastes, if you will, that are left inside the body and inside the bloodstream. You want those to be out of the equation because they're going to further the damage of the cells. So be careful with the amount of oxygen you're delivering. You want to keep them above 94% to make sure that the cells are getting the oxygen they need but no more than 99 because you don't want to give them more than what they actually need because you can actually end up causing more damage. All right, so that's a pretty, uh, pretty in-depth topic about uh, herniation and uh, treatment with uh, hyperventilation and that whole controversial issue. I want to switch gears here briefly as we come to a close. One other thing that you might encounter in a patient with traumatic brain injury is the appearance of battle sign or raccoon eyes. This here, the bruising behind the ears, we refer to that as battle sign, or where you have the bruising underneath the eyes and around the eyes. We, uh, for some reason, decided to call that a very sophisticated name, raccoon eyes. 
Sounds kind of like uh, like an insult, kind of like uh, a rhinoplasty for someone getting a nose job, comparing them to a rhinoceros. Uh, anyway, it's just one of those terms that uh, that kind of stuck. But regardless, in both of these cases, what this might indicate is the presence of a basilar skull fracture, meaning a fracture in the floor of the cranial vault, the base of the skull. So you have a fracture at the base of the skull, and that allows blood and sometimes cerebrospinal fluid to leak out into the tissues, thus the resulting bruising behind the ears or around the eyes. And sometimes you can even have blood that escapes to the exterior, maybe coming out of the nose or even out of the ear canal. You might have blood you might even have a clear fluid coming out that turns out to be cerebrospinal fluid. So how can you tell if this patient just has a nosebleed or some bleeding that's just on the inside of the ear? Well, one thing you can do is what's called the halo test. You can uh, dab a 4x4 four four, uh, dressing onto this blood, hold it up to the light, and sometimes, if there is blood that also contains cerebrospinal fluid, you might see this kind of uh, uh, clear liquid halo surrounding the dot of blood on that 4x4. So you hold it up to light, and you've got this ring on the outside of the blood that's kind of a clear liquid. Um, the, the other thing that you can do, say that you don't necessarily have blood coming out of the nose or the ear, but you've got this clear fluid coming out of the nose in a patient that has uh, suspected brain injury, head trauma. How do you know if that's cerebrospinal fluid or just simply a runny nose? Well, here's a novel idea. Take your glucometer and check the blood sugar content, in this case, the sugar content of this fluid coming out of their nose, and if you get any reading of sugar at all, that is not uh, a runny nose. There's no sugar in snot, but there is sugar in cerebrospinal fluid. So it's another way to test. Okay, folks, that concludes today's talk on traumatic brain injury. I hope you found it enlightening, and if so, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to support uh, future videos. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use that comment field below. I appreciate your time. Wish you the best. Take care.